Okay, so how do we get stuck in fear-based thinking? Um, it can happen from an experience of fear and a trauma, or it can happen even from cultural messages like fear of failure. You know, what, we get all these things that what if I fail at school or all of this thing that, that can just keep on going on and continuing to build tension. But really, the intensity and the repetition are, are often what gets it started. Okay, so if so, it's something that I'm really concerned about. Um, but also in terms of political messages, fear and anger are powerful political tools. They work. Okay, uh, they get that intensity going and that really pulls our mind into, into, the, into the narrow focus, okay? Um, and, and the cultural things like fear of failure, fear of, of being wrong, fear of being bad. So we have a big problem acknowledging the roots of, of racism in this country. And if you think about it, and, and there's a lot of studies on this that, that kind of take you in this direction, um, that, that it really is a, a resistance that no, we couldn't be like that. That's not who we are. Well, but we did do a lot of those things, and that is part of who we are. And to the extent that we now acknowledge it, we can move forward and deal with it in a healthy way to the extent that we pull it back. See what I just did? Tension. Okay. Put it down. Okay. Repetition. That is the key to the political messages. If you're paying attention to what's going on, they hit you again and again and again. And if you just pay attention to the next election season, how many messages contain fear? Okay, how many? Probably high percentage, very high percentage. Or all, yeah, many respects, yes. And the media does it too because it gets and keeps our attention. Okay, it works. Um, when we're stuck in fear-based thinking or when we're heading in that direction, questions are scorned. Okay, first of all, we're not tending to ask questions because our mind is pulled in that, in that narrow frame. But secondly, there's a group kind of a thing, again, particularly in politics, that if someone goes to either party and starts talking about the advantages of a position of the opposite party, you're going to be excluded, okay? I mean, it's, 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 there's a, it's not necessarily intentionally systematic. In some cases, it may be. Um, but there is an exclusion of other ways of looking at things, okay? And it really limits our creativity and so forth. And the group pressure. Okay, people are seen as either or, as opponents. And, and what happens, um, you can think of, of perceptions as having three components, a frame, filter, and focus. Okay, frame is the, just like a frame of these pictures. Okay, so I had a, a picture of a, the moon rising over the ocean on the wall of my office. And I would show it to people and say, see, there could be a boat over here, but we don't see it. Okay. There could be someone drowning here. We don't see it because this frame is all that the photographer showed us. So if you tell me there's, there's a person drowning on that picture, I'm going to think you're crazy because we don't see it. And what happens is they cre we create these frames as a result of fear-based thinking. And when they don't overlap, now you have a consistent voter. And all you have to do is get them out to the polls. Okay. What we need to do is to learn how to overlap the frame. The filter is the emotional component. We need to learn to clear our filters so we can understand the other person's filters because our emotions are all shared. We all share the exact same emotions. And people often said when I was in training in early in my career that, oh, you can't know what it's like to work with someone who's been in a war if you haven't been in a war. I've worked with probably 100 or more veterans, and trust me, I have a pretty good sense of what it feels like and what they felt like because we all have the same capacity for the same emotions if we're not blocking them with tension. So that's a, a really a point of connection between humans, between humans. And focus is what we pay attention to. And what they pull our focus to instead of in solving problems and understanding what's going on, the focus is on opposition and, and what's the problem with them rather than let's look at this problem and figure out how best we can deal with it. Okay? So what's happening to our brain? This is an important thing to remember, okay? Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of Ann Arbor, uh, where I live part-time now. And you can see there's lots of roads there, okay? And some of them are more well-defined than others, okay? There's US 14 and there's 23, 94 goes through there. Those are the roads that are most traveled, 
Okay, so those people were taking those routes over the years, so they eventually paved them and turned into highways, and then some of them they turned into limited access highways. That's very similar to how our brain works. Uh, our, every thought and experience and memory we have is actually a series of sequences between firing of neurons, and it creates a pathway. And so I remember Scotty because we met probably in 1970, Six, mid, probably. somewhere in there. Yeah, maybe yeah. even five. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I recognized her after a moment when you sat down. It's like, oh my gosh, I know you. Um, and uh, because there's a place in my brain where your face hangs out, <laughs> okay? And I, if, you were, if you were able to look inside my brain, those same neurons would have been firing. And the same would be true if, if I saw any of you tonight, okay? If I didn't see you uh, for two weeks and never saw you again, that wouldn't have been a very well-traveled place, but I ran into Scotty a lot and I saw her performances and we had friends in common. So there's a lot of ways I can, and you teach here at LCC and you did improvisational theater. And, and so there's a dozen ways that, that my brain connects with your face. Okay, there's lots of roads that get there. So far, each of you that I've met for the first time, there's only one way. Okay, but if we find we have something in common or if we have a conversation later, there's a lot of other ways and that's how our brain works is we have these interconnected places and the ones we travel most on become the easiest to travel on. So when you drive home tonight, if you've lived at your place for any length of time, you don't have to think about how to get there. Okay, if I was going to your place, I would have to, you know, look at the street signs and count the houses and look for the numbers and figure it out and be thinking actively. You can be thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. Okay, automatically you'll get there because your brain makes it that efficient. Okay. The problem is fear-based thinking pulls us to the same pathways again and again and again and prevents us from accessing other pathways. So what happens to our reality becomes like railroad tracks. Okay, there's no getting off the train. And really, if you think about what's happening politically in this country, there are tracks that don't intersect. And we have to figure out how to get off those tracks and to connect the people who are on them and who are stuck there uh, because they lead nowhere. They're not leading to any place nice, okay? We have to work together in order to be able to function as a, as a country and as a culture and as a world, ultimately, okay? And fear-based thinking is a huge obstacle to that. Think of any huge problem that we face. There's a common thread that runs through all of them. War, racism, sexism, discrimination, uh, police violence uh, against minorities. If you stop and think about it, they don't make sense. If you really look at the whole picture and, and take apart, okay, would I choose to do this if I really understood what was going on? You wouldn't choose to do any of them because they don't make sense, okay? They make the world more difficult for a lot of people and no one ultimately re really benefits from them, okay? That's what fear-based thinking does. It keeps us from making sense. And we need to get off the tracks and figure out how to communicate. And we can't do that when fear is dominating our, our consciousness. Okay, so I'd like you to take a few moments and talk just within the same groups that you had about ways that fear-based thinking might affect your life uh, or the life of the people that you serve. Okay. Um, who, would, who would like to contribute what you came up with? Um, how does fear-based thinking affect your lives or the lives of the students that you serve? Yeah. It makes me look for stuff that just reaffirms what I already think. Oh, okay. Instead of looking outside of myself yeah. to about your different yeah, ideas. Yeah, good point. Yeah, because it, it, our perception is narrow and our frame is small and we don't pay attention to what's outside of the frame. And we tend to see problems and miss opportunities yeah. because the opportunities usually are outside the frame. Yeah. And so everything becomes about problems. Yeah. That's a good point. The, the, the extreme case, just, just kind of to, to build on what you said, mm -hmm. the extreme case of that is suicide. When someone is suicidal, uh, and I worked on call for a lot and, and dealt with a lot of situations. Fortunately, none of them ever ended in tragedy. But what's, what happens is the pain, think of the pain as my hand, and the focus gets so narrow that they get stuck like this, and the only solution is to end the pain that it just it absorbs. 
and, and, and one lesson is to learn that pain is a part of life. We are going to experience pain in this life. It's just like it's going to rain someday. <laughs> okay, it's going to snow if you're in Michigan, hopefully this year. Um, uh, it's part of life, and if we learn to accept it and, and manage it, it actually becomes less distressful and less of a problem because when we tense against pain, there's a physiological response that increases the pain. Um, so the best thing to do is to relax and accept it and take it at that level. And I've had chronic pain now since the early 90s after a car accident and back surgery. And it's a matter of managing it and, and shifting the focus away from it. Okay, so, but you're right. We tend to get pulled in and we don't ask what's outside of it unless we consciously slow down enough to ask those questions. So, thank you. And, yes? So, yeah, I'm in the, I teach clinicals in the nursing program, and um, they actually are told in different classes on a regular basis, like a plethora of things that they will fail if they don't do this, if they're not on time, if they, mm. you know, don't pass this test, if they don't do this. So they're given right at the get-go, these are all the ways you can fail. And so, really hard to have them be creative or to like, they just kind of want to regurgitate what they need to give me so they don't fail. Yeah. And there's a huge difference between doing well and not failing. Yeah. 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 Or doing your best. Or doing your best. Yeah. 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 And, and there is a best way to handle every situation. Uh, that's my definition of hope. There's a best way to handle any situation. Uh, there was a man, uh, Jacques Lusserand, a Frenchman. Uh, he was blinded at the age of nine in an accident. This was just before World War II. And uh, when France was invaded, uh, he was like 12. And he started a children's underground that was actually more effective than the adult underground um, because no one suspected the kids. And they were disseminating news. They had a newspaper. And they actually rescued some pilots. And they were doing some really meaningful things. And then when he got to be older, they integrated him into the regular underground, and he eventually was captured and, uh, with some bunch of his friends and tortured. And uh, he was in a basement um, with four or six Nazi guards, highly skilled in inflicting pain. And he had this realization that he was freer than they were, okay? because they were being manipulated and we're losing his humanity. He was choosing to keep his humanity by not revealing his friends who hadn't been caught. He was freer than what they were. He discovered the best way to handle that situation. And even if it's imminent that you're going to die, there's a best way to die. Okay, there's a best way to do anything. And if that's our focus, we'll get closer and closer to it. If our focus is on not screwing up, we're probably more likely to screw up, okay? Because it pulls our attention to that and locks in the railroad trucks, okay? We stop asking questions and being creative. And, and uh, I don't know how many are familiar with the Gallup research on, on management, um, but 70% uh, of people are generally unhappy in their jobs and are kind of going through the motions. So it's only around 30%. Love to do. Yeah, there's only 30% that, that actually enjoy going to work. And, and so it's like, oh my gosh, something's going on here. But think of the role of fear and the, and the pressure and, and how that, that and, and, and Hob and I were talking on the way up here about uh, people are working more and more hours and less and less happy and satisfied. satisfied. And um, I read a, a novel recently, um, The Green River, I think it was called, but it's about Australia, and a, a man who was, um, born in England and was sentenced to Australia instead of being hung, okay? So he went there with his family and worked through his sentence and saved up some money and bought some property and was working from dawn to dusk to, to and it was in an area where there was an indigenous population to plant some crops and to raise some animals and they weren't getting enough food and they were really uncomfortable. And here's this indigenous tribe working maybe 10 to 15 hours a week and the rest of the time they're singing and dancing and playing music and, and they thought they were civilized. <laughs> okay. But we need to stop and think, okay? Because we get into this tracks of this is civilization. This is progress. Well, is it? Okay. Uh, we need to ask those questions. There are parts of it that yes, I think probably are if we look at it, but other parts that are creating problems and we need to sort that out instead of just taking the railroad tracks and saying this is the only way we go. 
uh, that defines our, our reality. So, yeah, thank you for that comment. Other thoughts on that question? Yes. I think just in general, what we're talking about and the role of fear just um, reduces the quality of life that we have. Absolutely. And another thing is that it reduces our options and choices that we have, especially if we're talking about some irrational fears that mm -hmm. don't pose any immediate threat, like for mm -hmm. example, being afraid of flies or sharks. Mm -hmm. So when there's probably nothing really to be afraid of, but of course that's something that we're irrationally afraid of. We prevent ourselves from being on the plane, going places, mm -hmm. not swimming in the ocean, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and uh, I worked with a lot of people who were diagnosed as having like specific phobias for, for different things. And, and there's an interesting component here that's related to what you said about a, a component of fear that's really important to remember, and that's control. Because when we're afraid, we try to control, and we're less able to move with or work with what's happening and, and take in other information and other points of view and, and work together. Uh, the tendency is to want to control, which could be a lot of the problem that happens with management and, and fear-based thinking. But an interesting thing with people who are afraid of a specific thing, uh, and the traditional treatment, I found people many times were traumatized by that because they would try to force them to go into that situation and, and confront it. And, and they might have a panic attack or all kinds of other problems and it just seemed cruel somehow. But, but what I found worked was to set it up that, so that they had absolute total control over that situation. So for example, I, I worked with a woman who had a fear of going over a bridge. Okay, she drove 40 miles out of her way to avoid going over the highway um, on a bridge. Okay, she just could not drive across a bridge. And it's like, are you, are you functioning that way? It's taking me a lot of extra time, but I'm getting to work and I'm getting my stuff done, but I don't want to go on like this. Okay, well let's, first of all, we'll restore some balance, which is the first part, it's letting go of this and the breathing and the grounding. Um, and then let's take a look at this, okay? When you're ready, okay, and it took a few weeks and she got into balance and was feeling okay, Let's just stay away from bridges until we get the balance restored. And then if you drive up to a bridge, you make a choice. Um, and have someone with you when you decide to do this. Okay, they can take, get, take over the car if, they, if you want. But you stop and make a choice. You're going to go across the bridge or not. And it's perfectly fine to not go across the bridge. The first time she did that, she backed off and didn't go. Fine. Cool. We'll just do that. Next time, same thing. You make a choice. When you're ready, start to go across, and if you change your mind, you can get out of the car and have your friend take over, or you can even back up. Do it at a, choose a bridge where there's not a lot of traffic, okay, and your friend can, you know, run interference. Third time, her fear of bridges is gone, okay? Just that sense of control. And the same thing, someone's afraid of going out in public, so let's arrange it so you can always leave. Have someone with you, so that if you're at Walmart or wherever the store is, you can just park your car, you know, give them a call, apologize, <laughs> okay, later, but just go, okay, and make sure you always have enough groceries so you don't have to, you know, and, and so you're in control, and it's that control that we seek when we're in a, when a state of fear, and sometimes having that sense that, yes, I have choices and I can make a difference here is important in letting go of a deeply ingrained pattern of fear that gets stuck in fear-based thinking. So, other thoughts? personal experience with that. Okay. About 16 years old, I'm definitely afraid of spiders. Okay. And so at 16, when I went, uh, I went to East Lansing once, I used to have a pet store there, and I walked in, I asked the guy, I said, hey, I'm really afraid of spiders. I said, so I'm, I'm in here to ask you if I could let you uh, put a tarantula on. And he said, mm. yes. So he grabbed this brown tarantula and put it in my hand. He said, no, don't scare it because if it jumps off your hand, it'll crack like an egg and then you'll owe me 60 bucks. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So he put it on and it walked around my arm and I stood there for a while. And then when I was all day, he said, are you done? I said, yep. I gave it back. I was still deathly afraid of spiders. <laughs> yeah, the, the first step would be to, to be in balance. And the second would be to, you're always in control. Oh, sure. So the spider isn't crawling on you, you're you're having, and, and you have to ask, you know, how much effort is it worth, you know, how much time you're going to spend with spiders. I, I didn't know um, all that. Yeah, yeah. I so, and yeah. And the problem is, is, is if a spider is crawling on most people, we're going to, oh, yeah. it's actually going to increase the fear. I might be able to be very still, but I walk out, mm -hmm. okay, um, for most of us anyway.